We're next going to look at recommender systems. And if you've ever bought a book from Amazon or uh, rented a movie from Netflix, then you've probably used a recommender system. K nearest neighbor graphs are a very natural way of implementing nearest neighbor systems. We're going to look at the Movie Lens Ratings data set. This is about a million anonymous ratings of about 3,900 movies from about 60 or 6,000 Movie Lens users. Uh, the data is in the form of three files, two small, the movies.dat and users.dat, and then the ratings.dat, which is large. The goal is to use the ratings. People rate the movies one to five and these are movies from the Internet Movie Database and then for a given person we want to predict 10 movies that they have not yet seen that they would have rated highly had they seen them. So we're going to find that if they haven't rated a movie that tends to correspond to a rating of zero. Key idea to start out with is we have to first do some data management. This is not pre-processing. We're not changing the data itself, but we'll have to manage how it's presented and how it's utilized, uh, primarily for purposes of speed and memory. So the readings.dat data has a user ID, a movie ID, a rating, and a timestamp. And we have a million rows of such uh, ratings. The movies.dat data has a movie ID, the title of the movie, and the categories that the movie occupies. The user data is ID, gender, age, occupation, zip code, things like that. Now we're not going to use the user data or the categories data. It's, it's excellent information, but we're going to keep things simple. We're going to have to recast the data into a sparse matrix. And the key here is that most people rate far fewer than 4,000 movies. So therefore, if we think of the movie ratings data as a matrix where we have columns are the movies and rows are the observations, i.e. the users, then we would be looking at a huge matrix, but most of it would be zeros. So instead of actually writing down the zeros, which would be 180 megabytes in size, and that's enormous, especially when you start making temporary copies to do multiplications and stuff, and it'd also be very slow. So we'll be working with what's called a sparse matrix. I'll tell you about that in a minute. So the ratings data, the user ID, movie ID rating, one million rows. We're going to convert this, we're not going to use the timestamp, we're going to convert this into ratings, rows, and columns. The rows are going to be the user IDs, and the columns are going to be the movie IDs. And so the movie lens data is going to be defined by the rating I at row I, column I and therefore it's going to look like a rectangle even though it actually isn't a full rectangle of data. Here is the actual data. You can see that most of it is zeros. A sparse matrix format is where only the non-zero entries are stored, everything else is zero. And they're only included when they're absolutely necessary, for instance when you're doing this printout. Here is the actual movie lens data. So on the left we have the number of movies rated, so you see most people rate fewer than uh, a hundred movies. Uh, there are some people who go up to what, about 150 to 250, about a thousand of those, about 500 who go from 250 up to about 350, so on and so forth. And there on the right you can see the average ratings. So four seems to be the most typical, three is next, and five is after that. To actually do assignment two and learn about the data, we're not actually going to work immediately with the movie lens data. So I created a scenario called the Small Town Zoo. 
This is 250 households by 177 animals and 8 bytes per rating. That's a 345k of data, about the size of a smartphone photograph. So this is a very accessible set of data. So we're going to create a recommender system for both data sets, but we're going to motivate everything we do via the movie lens data. That's the real problem. First off, we don't want to use correlation. When we correlate two uh, users or observations X and Y, it depends both on how similarly X and Y rate movies that they both have seen and how many movies X and Y have actually rated. Now this is not good. Why? Well, let's look at an actual user. And now, let's suppose we take the same user and create an observation where all we did was just put a few more movies in and you'll see not many just here and there we stuck another rating in otherwise it's identical to X. The correlation here is only 0 0.68 even though as far as the movies they have in common they're identical. So instead we're going to use what's called cosine similarity. So correlation is given by this uh, formula so you got the product of the differences or the deviations from the means uh, on the top and you divide by the square roots of the sum of the square deviations now if we were to use this turns out there are so many zeros so many unrated movies per user the means really have no utility in fact they're practically zero So instead we're going to use cosine similarity, which is just correlation, where x bar and y bar are both zero. So here is our cosine similarity function. And we're going to introduce some notation. We're going to let bracket x comma y be x1, y1, x2, y2, and that's just the, the uh, dot product of vectors x and y. Sometimes we write it x dot y and that turns our cosine similarity measure into the dot product of x and y over the square root of x dotted with itself and y dotted with itself. And we say that xy is the dot product and in terms of matrix algebra it's given by a transpose of a column times a column. Now comparison when you do cosine similarity is on a common subspace. So here I have the dot product above, and of course that's the numerator of the cosine similarity measure below. If x1 is equal to 0, then that first product is 0, and therefore it's as if the movie 1 doesn't even exist. Likewise, if y2 is 0, then movie 2 is ignored. So this means that only movies uh, both X and Y have seen are using, used in determining similarity. And in the denominators, likewise, movies that one or the other haven't seen play no role. So that makes this an excellent way of doing recommender systems. So x similar to y in the sense of direction is what defines cosine similarity. And it's called cosine similarity because it's the cosine of the angle between the vectors x and y in your n-dimensional space. Therefore, if uh, k of x, y is close to 1, then x and y are approximately parallel. And if uh, x dot with itself is about the same as y dot with itself, then the cosine similarity would say that x would also be about the same as y. Unfortunately, this is rarely true that dotting with x and dotting with y are the same, but it does tend to be true for subgroups. So females watching romances, uh, teenagers watching action-adventure, so on and so forth. So it's unfortunate that we're not going to use the user.dat and the, the categories information. It would be a better recommender if we did. The small town zoo data, even though it's the one we're going to play with, it's not the movie lens data because it's simulated. 
uh, we create it using a random number generator. Now last time we imputed missing values into our small town data set and we'll apply the recommender system to this pre-processed data where we remove the NAs using uh, the imputation technique. Later we'll do the same for MovieLens because it comes from a complex system not a random number generator and as we'll see later in this lecture that does matter it's extremely important so here's the data for the small town zoo you can see most of the entries are zeros because people haven't seen all the exhibits so if the X is the Williams household and Y is the Davis household then X dot Y is what you see there and notice all the zeros so these don't even play a role so only the non-zero in other words the movies they've seen in common or in this case the animal exhibits they've seen in common are actually going to play a role so the algorithm is pretty simple you do cosine similarity for all pairs of households you connect each household to its k nearest neighbors in the sense of cosine similarity and then if you want to recommend a movie to a user you get the ratings of the users K nearest neighbors, so excuse me, uh, and you keep only those the user has not seen. In other words, you look at where the user has zeros, then you look at their neighbors and you recommend to the user those animals with the highest average similarity among the neighbors of the ones the user hasn't seen. So let's just look at this graphically. We construct the K nearest neighbor network via cosine similarity there it is here we're using k equals 3 just to illustrate and then we look at the out degree of the user so we look at the out connections that gives us Smith Davis and more now we want to rate some exhibits and recommend some exhibits so the user and Smith Davis and more notice the user has zeros in several exhibits. I've marked those. And so now we can go through and do our recommendations. So the aardvark, if we average over the highlighted region of the neighbors of the user, the closest neighbors gave it a 4.67. Now Smith and Moore haven't seen the alpaca exhibit, so we're just going to throw those out. We're not going to use them. So therefore, we say that we have a 1 for the nearest neighbor's uh, prediction for the user for the alpaca. Likewise, we throw out the 0 and get 2.5 for the anteater. And nobody's seen the uh, odad. Nobody even knows what it is, right? And so we just ignore that completely. So what do we recommend to the user household? That they'll really enjoy the aardvark exhibit. We don't recommend alpaca or anteater. And you might say, well, gosh, is that all there is to it? And the answer is, yeah, that's it. That's all there is to it. So does that mean, really, there's nothing to it? Well, it's just arithmetic. Cosine similarity, drawing a graph, some averaging over the neighbors. The only complications are size with the movie lens data and speed, uh, but there is more to it. First off, what's to it is not the computing, not the programming. It's things like this. Is a K nearest neighbor's graph a good model of real world interrelationships? Well, it is sometimes, but then sometimes it's not. And that is the complication. The algorithm itself, darn near trivial. <laughs>